Hey folks, my name is Xavier Harding and I'm on the marketing team here at Mozilla Foundation. And today we are talking about the app called Privacy Party. I'm here with Tracy Chow. Tracy's a founder, an engineer, a friend of Mozilla. Back in 2022, Mozilla helped fund Tracy's service Block Party, an app that helped users deal with harassment on social media platforms. Most recently, the folks that brought you Block Party are back with another party called Privacy Party. It's been out for a few months now. I'm hoping we can talk about it. Um, but first off, Tracy, how are you doing? I'm doing great. A little bit sad about the dreariness of winter, but excited yeah. to talk today. I am too. Yeah. It's, it's like really great today. Like I have my lights on that I usually don't have and like, it's just gross. Um, I was going to work in a joke where I haven't seen you all year, but I, I decided to <laughs> not do that because now it's 2024. That's a joke. Okay. So first let's give folks some like background. What, uh, is your origin story? What? made you want to make apps kind of centered around online harassment? My background is in engineering and I worked the whole kind of like roundup of Silicon Valley tech companies, um, worked at a bunch of different social media companies in the past and even worked on things like the moderation tools and admin tools. Um, while I was working at these companies, I noticed that they had a very serious diversity problem, uh, which I started to speak about um, to flag attention to the issue that the lack of diversity on our teams building technology meant that maybe we were not going to be building the best products. Um, one of the examples I would sometimes share is the lack of foresight around potential abuse and harassment and misuse of the platforms we're building. And it all comes full circle in that in doing this diversity and inclusion work, I then got a bunch of this abuse and harassment that I talked about the platforms not solving for due to their lack of diversity. Right. So that brings me to working on Block Party V1, which was anti-harassment, anti-spam, and just general safety and cleanup tools for Twitter. Um, it was out of a lot of personal experience having dealt with the really horrible mental health impacts of seeing all the negative stuff that was coming at me, but also pairing that with um, the recognition that there is a lot of good stuff online. And I was getting a lot of value out of being online um, from the activism side, being able to get the message out there, but also just from a personal professional development capacity, being able to learn from really interesting people, interact with folks online yeah. um, and having that little, that juxtaposition of, um, all the potential that was good about being online and all the negative and, um, hearing people tell me in response to abuse and harassment, I was getting that I should just log off, mm, yeah. um, <clears throat> like go touch grass or whatever which, people say these days, which made me very frustrated. Like, why should I have to go away and not be able to participate in the good stuff just because there are some mean people who, right. Yeah have nothing better to do with their lives. Uh, and so the broader idea behind Block Party, the company and the different tools we're building is that we want to make it possible for everyone to participate online um, and partake in the digital prosperity uh, that is possible. And that can take a, di a bunch of different forms. Um, in the various products we built, there was Block Party V1, um, which was more of the anti-harassment side, but now also with Privacy Party, helping people to more proactively secure their settings and be confident about how they are showing up online. Yeah, you kind of, <clears throat> it sounds like you want the good of the social media landscape, but like not the bad, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. So what does Privacy Party do that Block Party doesn't do? What do I get out of this new party? <laughs> This new party comes, it's sort of like a pre-party. Pre-party, um, pre-game. Yeah. So um, what Privacy Party helps you to do is look through all your different social media and online accounts and help you to secure your settings, make sure that people don't have access that they shouldn't, and also to just generally clean up what is showing up for you. So for example, that might mean making sure that people don't have access to your photos on Facebook that mm. shouldn't. Um, and reviewing the different access and logins that are on your Instagram account and make sure that there's no unauthorized access. Uh, we heard about the need for something like this in talking to users of the previous product. Uh, so these were the folks who were on Twitter very heavily and often experiencing harassment and abuse um, based on who they are, what they do, 
might be folks like journalists or activists or public health educators. And what we were hearing was that it was very helpful in a reactive way. Once harassment was happening, bad stuff was happening, they're getting a lot of cruft um, and unwanted stuff in their mentions. Yeah. That block party was helping them there. But there's a lot of stuff to be done beforehand to make sure that information they might have once put online, uh, not thinking that it might be used against them, was actually being weaponized against them. And mm -hmm. it could be things like doxing. It could be things like um, fraud attacks or scam attacks. And so there's sort of a need to build out that more holistic safety experience. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> I remember randomly two nights ago, uh, which was Sunday night, I got an email from Facebook that said like, hey, you were, you requested a recovery code. Here's that code. Also, if you didn't request this, let us know because scams happen. And I didn't request it. So I immediately changed my password. But I guess that, that leads me to ask you uh, about Privacy Party. What exactly can it do and what exactly can't it do? Like, what is it good for? But what are the things that you don't want people to get twisted that it can't do? Because it's, it's like not a perfect barrier mm -hmm. to negativity. Yeah. I would say what it can do is make sure all your settings are tightened up. And so uh, it can give you the best practice recommendations, kind of factoring in all the various trade-offs um, and make sure that you have a pretty good default safety setting. But in security, nothing is absolute. Uh, everything is also a trade-off. If you want to go maximum security and privacy, that could look like you never go online and avoid yeah. all surveillance cameras ever, but that's a trade off against convenience and usability and just you wanting to go about your life and what you might prioritize day to day. Um, maybe another analogy I can share is, is something like fitting out your home with a uh, lock and key. So when you leave, you lock it up. It's some barrier against unauthorized access. It's not perfect, but it does stop random people who are just passing by roaming in and going through your stuff. Somebody who's really dedicated, really, really dedicated can still get in. They can break a window, even maximum security vaults at banks sometimes get compromised. Yeah. So like, it's really hard to get to that perfect assurance, but you probably also don't want to live in a maximum security vault either. So it's sort of how do we get you that pretty good default? Like let's put locks on your doors and you can feel pretty good about having taken good actions. Um, but everybody's threat model will also be different, um, the different types of attacks that you might be worried about and safety and security concerns that you might be worried about. Um, so we're trying to give you a good default, but somebody who's very, very dedicated can do a lot of things. We're not gonna promise to protect you against all possible harms. Yeah, <clears throat> which is probably impossible to do so anyway. But yeah, it's a good point. You don't wanna live in like, uh, bank vault level kind of thing because that would just be too cumbersome um so you guys released this tool about a few months ago how's it been mm -hmm. going what have you been seeing what are people saying it's been really good we've gotten a lot of really um affirming feedback of the form it feels like magic this is a magical product experience um and often people are reacting to actually just seeing the product in action um it's almost like that experience like if you have your laptop out and like your friend comes over and they're like, here, let me do some stuff for you. And so like they're kind of <laughs> leaning over, right. over you. Which I personally would be stressed out. I, that, that's stressful. I wouldn't trust that. I mean, I, I, as much as I trust my friends, I'm like, what, just tell me what you're doing. But what we're doing is showing you what's happening. So they're not taking the laptop and turning it away from you. It's still right in front of you. You get to see everything that's happening. Um, but what our browser extension is doing is like flipping through all your different settings, gathering up what's there and taking the actions for you at your directive. So if you've said, okay, like, let's lock all this down. I don't want people to see my phone number and my hometown and um, my relatives on Facebook, you can actually see all that happening in the browser. So it's just kind of flashing in front of you. Um, so that um, has been really nice to hear. Some of the other stuff we've been hearing from folks, which is really interesting is um, the different use cases where it comes up. One interesting one is the uh, rogue employee or ex-employee or somebody who has got a little bit astray. They might be um, upset about something that happened. Maybe it's like a formerly terminated employee. And you're talking the amount such of damage. It sounds like an actual person you're talking about. It's like we've heard about this from like multiple <laughs> scenarios where I could, 
basically somebody goes a little bit rogue and then everybody in the organization needs to lock things down. It's like, oh yes, like there is somebody who is like upset and has a vendetta. And now we just need to lock things down because it's going to get weaponized against us. It's like a very clear attack. Um, And there's also just the folks who are generally more conscious already of privacy who are curious to check out what the recommendations were and very surprised to see that despite the level of care they've already put in, we found a bunch more settings that they weren't aware of. So it's sort of like the people who wanted to test, like, how good am I? How good have I been? Because I think I'm pretty good. And then realizing that there's still more space to improve. And yeah. some of that is because the platforms are really sneaky and will introduce new settings with defaults <laughs> that are not what you want to be the defaults. They don't tell you that those are there. Sometimes defaults change. Um, That's the other thing. Sometimes change. defaults change to add new features. Tracy, I have so many questions about this shadowy figure you just introduced to the story of Privacy Party. I, I hope you come in again to the show to tell us about, th- there's a sequel here, I feel like. There's like now a yeah. sequel here. <laughs> um, so you described it as basically, it's kind of like your friend comes by and flips all these settings. And when you actually use the extension itself, you can kind of see all of the, like Harry Potter magic style, you just kind of see all the settings get flipped. Do you want to talk about kind of the technical stuff like how did you make this how hard was it to make in the first place and maybe even how difficult it will be to keep an extension like this current because i imagine settings menus change yeah the high level of it with the browser extension is that we are writing code that can do the things that you can do in the browser so we can click on buttons open up menus select different settings for you but we're just doing stuff in the browser based on the ui so we're looking sometimes at the shape of the web page so looking at here's the title of this section um sometimes we're looking for specific text that describes what settings we're looking at and then we're just taking those actions on the user's behalf um what is really nice is that this is very flexible we don't need the platforms necessarily to have built apis um the application programming interfaces that make it easy to do that programmatic um, interaction. What's challenging is that because it's based on the UIs and what typically um, is the human interface, some of these things will change. The interfaces may change. There may be A-B tests around how things are presented. Things may look different um, if you are a longtime user versus a new user. It may look different in different countries and different languages. So it can be tricky to make sure that your automations work in all these different scenarios. Um, Some of the stuff that we've had to build in is really smart and graceful error handling. We haven't gotten all the way, but there's a lot of thought put into, okay, like what are the potential classes of errors that might happen? Um, Is it that we can't find the element? Is it that we can't find the page? Is it that some modal has popped up unexpectedly? Um, All the different types of unexpected things that might happen. Then we also write in what are the the ways that we want to handle this? Do we want the user to interact with it? Do we just have some default? All right, we'll just skip this and move on. Um, or do we need to break here and ask the user to do something? Um, so uh, there's a whole different set of software engineering concerns when it comes to building this type of software that intersects with the usability. Um, and it does require us to have a pretty high bar around the error monitoring and making sure that when new types of errors happen, like we see them and can react to them really quickly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a fun technical challenge. Like you yeah, have a big space, like... a lot of latitude to operate and also a lot of things that you need to protect yourself against. Yeah, I do. I wonder, do you have like Google alert set up for when Facebook makes a change to their, like, do you have, like, that's, it would be a tough task to contest. Cause I think, I, I'm thinking of so many things at once, but I think about dark patterns and <clears throat> these dark patterns that for those who don't know them, basically, uh, uh, psychological tricks that make you do what a company wants you to do as opposed to what you may want to do. Um, And I have to imagine a lot of these interfaces are designed with the company's preferences in mind, even if they may be presented as, you know, user preferences, system settings. So I hope that, you know, the folks at Privacy Party and you all at Privacy Party and and, then all the parties, you know, I'm just wishing you luck luck and strength to like keep up with these because I have a feeling these companies will do whatever it takes to continue to like get the better end of the deal there. 
You're speaking to a really interesting concept that underlies a lot of how we've been set up as a company that's outside the platforms. Um, and it has to do with the incentives. So we look a lot at right. what do the companies care about? What are their driving business incentives? And I wouldn't necessarily say that the companies are motivated in the like highest order to invade your privacy. It's just yeah. that the things that they are trying to do do not directly increase privacy either. So right. that is something that may get compromised on the side. Uh, that's never going to be their top priority to maximize user safety and experience. Yeah. So sometimes it will then get neglected. It becomes sort of a casualty as other things are optimized. But what's different about privacy party and block party as a third party, so many parties. <laughs> um, parties today. <laughs> that are parties that are being thrown for the end user <laughs> that we are we are most incentivized to make sure that they have the best experience like the people that we care about securing the safety of like those are the people that we are serving and we will be successful if we give them the most secure safe wonderful experience online so that's like where the incentive alignment comes in is really important for us yeah, that's great. And I also know, I mean, you've been a friend of Mozilla for a long time now. Um, but I noticed that this extension is on Firefox specifically. Was there anything behind that choice besides you being a fan of Mozilla? We want to be where people are and where people want to use these safety products. We also have support on Chrome. Um, but for Firefox in particular, it was interesting to um, build the extension support because Firefox already has a very privacy conscious audience. And so our thinking behind this was like, there's probably a lot of folks who already have opted into a more privacy default stance that are using Firefox. And so these are the people that are actually gonna care as well to go make sure that their social media settings are also locked down. So we should really make sure that we are providing support to these people, meeting them where they are. Yeah, <clears throat> I remember last time we spoke uh, last year, you mentioned something interesting about, you know, what if uh, APIs were regulated by uh, regulators or were, were required to be regulated by like public, public officials. Can you talk more about that? Like, I'd be interested in hearing more about that from you. Yeah, so APIs, the application programming interfaces make it straightforward for third party developers to build different experiences. And they were what enabled us to build really seamless tools on Twitter originally for anti-harassment, anti-spam, and collecting um, data and documentation as well for potential abuse. What was really nice about those APIs was that we could run in the background. Um, the APIs specify sort of like clear contracts between third parties like Block Party and platforms like Twitter. It made it really easy to just like uh, build those experiences and have some guarantees around how they should work. What has made it difficult for us is now is because the APIs are not required uh, with platform ownership changes. They have made it a lot more difficult to access things programmatically, uh, which has pushed us in this other direction doing browser extension development. But if you get back to um, that question of APIs, there's so much that's possible when there are these clear interfaces and standardization. Um, some other examples of things that are possible in addition to safety tools are like the research and analysis that a lot of folks have previously done on Twitter and Reddit because they had good APIs. There's right. ways to pull down the data in a structured format, query it, do analysis. And now that those gates have been closed, it's just a lot harder to even understand what's happening to build the tools for end users to do what they want to do. Um, there's an analogy as well to um, the browser world, actually in that uh, previously, it was actually not straightforward for browsers like uh, Firefox necessarily be able to exist and run on different operating systems. Mm -hmm. Like if manufacturers had their way, they would be able to bundle just their 
their browser yeah, was offering some the day, disallow others. And, Microsoft, yeah, and channel. it was actually due to regulatory efforts to say like, no, you must allow these APIs to be available so that different browsers can plug into the different operating system functions so that they can also provide native application experiences. So users have a choice of the browser client that they use to interact with the web. And it's possible now for users to have this choice. They can uh, opt for Firefox if they want more privacy. There's other browsers as well that are more privacy forward. Brave is an example. Um, there's people who are innovating on the experience. So Arc is one of these new ones. Um, but it's just good that users have more choice. And because of this competition as well, it forces all the makers of these different browsers to be pushing things forward and improving on the various aspects of user experience and also in things like privacy and security. When there's no competition, you're, you're locked into whatever the dominant platform wants you to have. They have no incentive to improve. Um, and that's where I want social media to get to, where there's um, these APIs that make it possible for users to have more choice of the experiences because other developers would be able to create different experiences that speak to different priorities users might have. Some might care more about safety. Some might care about a certain type of user experience that they want to have. And right now we have no choices really. Like if you want to use Facebook, you use Facebook the way they want you to experience it. Um, TikTok, it is their app. It is exactly their algorithm. Yeah. You don't have a choice. I'm interested in your thoughts. Like, <clears throat> how do you feel about the latest news about like the Fediverse and all these ideas that people have about having one login for the entire web and using threads to access Mastodon, et cetera, et cetera. Do you feel like that could be an answer to it? I think the Fediverse is very interesting um, in this idea that you can have all these different platforms that interact with each other instead of each being their own walled garden. One of the sad things for me about Twitter's change in ownership was Twitter was a platform that I had built my audience I couldn't bring it with me anywhere else. So when there was a bit of this diaspora and people went to Mastodon, people went to Blue Sky or Threads, all of that was just fractured and lost for me. Yeah. Um, and other people have, have spoken about this problem as well. There's like this lack of interoperability, there's no portability, and you're stuck um, in the walled garden. With Threads integrating with the Fediverse and using this protocol to interact with Mastodon and all the other um, platforms that are on this protocol, you're no longer locked in. And in theory, um, that means that even if you get started on threads and build an audience there, if you no longer like being on threads, you can move your account and all of your followers somewhere else, which puts more pressure on, let's say it is threads to keep improving on their experience and make it so that you want to be there because maybe it's their algorithms are better. Maybe it's their content moderation that's better. And there are reasons for you to stay besides you are stuck. Um, so that's very encouraging. I think there are still a lot of open questions about how will all this stuff work in practice. Um, sometimes you do want a central authority <laughs> and there are certain things that will not work in a fully decentralized way. Um, for example, specifically on the topic of content moderation, there are some types of content that should not exist on on the platform or whatever it is whatsoever. It should be taken down. It's not just a question of, do you want to hide it from your personal view, but it's stuff that really should not be there at all. Right. In a central, um, in a world where there's a central authority, they can issue a takedown. They can remove the terrorist content or they can remove the child sexual abuse materials. In a decentralized world where there's no one central authority, it's a lot harder to say who is going to be in charge of doing that? Is it just at the level of like, people can choose what things they want to see or not want to see? Like some stuff will cause you harm whether or not you personally see it. Like you're just an ostrich putting your head in the sand and right. the bad stuff is still there. Um, so there are still some tricky questions to figure out. I'm heartened that there are a lot of smart people who are working on these things and trying to figure them out. Um, but we'll, we'll see how it actually works out. Yeah, and then my other question, I mean, related to that is, you know, the portability of the Fediverse and where we're going is great. Um, does that make your job with Privacy Party and does that make overall privacy 
better for social media online or do you feel like it makes the job harder? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think there's one aspect of this push into the Fediverse that is very nice, which is that there are these standardized protocols, right? Because we're allowing different players to all interact with each other. That means that we have to define how they're interacting, which means that we have already the standardization that's baked in and it makes it easier then to go into the world where you have APIs. We've already had to define what are the uh, ways in which we talk to each other across different servers from uh, threads to all these different Mastodon servers. Like there's already a, a standard interface, which means that if we do want to build solutions, we can build them once and they will apply to all of these that are sharing the, the protocol. Sure um, but it's hard to say for sure with any technology that people are interacting with because people get very creative in the ways that they use technology. Um, so hard to perfectly predict what they're going to do and if they're going to find sneaky ways to get around things. True. Tracy, what if the problem is us? Like what if human beings are just, just, we're just doomed to always just be our own worst enemy. What if, what if I'm the problem? I mean, I think that's sort of the secret, the not, not so secret secret. A lot of these issues that people have tried to blame on social media and being online are really human problems. Yeah. Like a lot of the harassment I've gotten in the past was sexist or racist in nature. Sure. The social media platforms are sort of at fault for facilitating the ease of people saying terrible things to me, but the root problem of the sexism and racism was not created by social media. That stuff has been around for millennia. Yeah. Regardless of what platform you're using, <laughs> well, even if it's just like a town square or like real life. Yeah. I think the difference is the scale at which things can happen and the level yeah. of connectivity. Um, like I've thought about the analogy of walking down the street in a big city and the likelihood that I'll get some street harassment or some cat calling. And like, it happens maybe a couple of times if it's a bad day. If you're having a bad day online, I've been swarmed by 4chan folks. It's bad. Like you can get yeah. a lot of people <laughs> all at once. It will be much, much more than what you would get from walking down the street, even on a bad day. But it's that scale of connecting all these people from wherever they are across the world to be able to direct terrible things at you. So things that can happen at digital scale are just categorically different now because of that. Um, yeah, that that the the difference in what's possible when physical limitations are no longer there. When we're in the offline world, yeah. we are limited by atoms. <laughs> Like there right. could only be so many people in a space at a given time when you're in the digital world and it's all bits, no atoms anymore, then you Unlimited lose those harassment. constraints. Um, and so that can be a really awesome thing in some ways when it's channeled for good, when you think about actually the example of activism and being able to have this megaphone that is truly potentially a global megaphone to reach, I don't know, like tens of millions of people. Like that's incredible. Like for some of the, um, the leading voices who are pushing forward really groundbreaking insights and challenges to how we should think about how we approach the world. That's incredible that they can have that platform. Yeah. So that's a good thing in some ways. Um, people who have been traditionally marginalized or not, have not been able to have voice can have that voice now and have it be magnified and spread um, in a viral way. That can be a really good, positive thing. But it comes with the flip side of when it's bad, it also is really, really bad. Yeah, the flip side is like an entire message board will <clears throat> verbally attack you relentlessly. Yeah. So then I guess maybe the question we can end on is how do we go from this online world where an entire fan base of people will be in your mentions versus the most bad that can happen online is just like a, a single cat call. How do we go from the level of bad it's at now online? How do we get it to like the level of IRL bad, if that makes sense? I think it is instructive to think about in the offline world, how we have introduced more structure and stability 
and governance that happens. Like we all live in nation states that have rule of law and they're not perfect by any means, but there is a system of governance. It is transparent what the laws are. There's law enforcement. And in addition to the laws, there are also strong social norms around what you should do or not do in polite company. What we're lacking online is that overarching governance where we've kind of just allowed platforms to do what they want. And we essentially have these, you know, we hope benevolent dictators, but they're essentially dictators running these different platforms at the moment. Uh, the laws are not transparent, so we don't know what is going to be allowed or not allowed. That's why people are always upset about, like, I got to take down notice or like my account's been suspended. I didn't even do anything and I don't know why and I can't appeal it. Uh, and it's not clear who is making the decisions and what rules they're basing them on. Uh, law enforcement is very, quote unquote, law enforcement is very uneven. Uh, yeah. So even if there is a fair set of rules somewhere, they're not enforced evenly across the user base. So I think there's a lot that can be done around improving governance of these systems um, and transparency and also instituting stronger social norms. So uh, it does feel like there's a lot of stuff that's not necessarily illegal, but people won't do it um, <laughs> in the offline world. Yeah. People look at you funny or like you just you, you get this sense of um, yeah. disapprobation. And online, the norms are very much like you can be really horrible and that's fine. It doesn't seem to matter. It's okay. Like that's, that's okay. Um, so I think they're shifting those things. I think another big component of it is um, individual people asserting that they want to have choice and they want to be able to be in control of their experience for a long time. A lot of us have just kind of thrown up our hands and said, okay, well, I just have to do whatever the technology overlords have decided is right. going to be my experience um because it's felt for a very long time like there's nothing you can do to get facebook to do differently um these big tech giants will do what they want to do and it can be terrible for you but you just have to live with it um and i think people individuals like we can demand more um we shouldn't have to live with harassment or complete violation of our privacy as the cost of modern day life and being online. Right. Um, and there are multiple routes to getting there. One is directly demanding better of the platforms, but I think actually given their business incentive, it's unlikely that a bunch of people shouting at the platforms is going to do that much. There are some levers um, with more impact. So you've seen sometimes celebrities will throw their weight around. Uh, Taylor Swift might be able to get Instagram to do some things differently on Instagram. Um, but the other route for more ordinary people expressing what they care about is actually going through legislation and policy through the old school lawmaking, uh, which is not to say that we should have all of technology regulated in this like very specific way that only speaks to what, where the technology is right now. Like we can and we should come up with better ways of regulating technology that can be more expansive and flexible to how technology is going to evolve and how the ways that people use technology will evolve. But I think there can be more of a role in the governance of our offline world, stepping in to make sure that there is also governance of the online world. <clears throat> yeah, I want to call back something you mentioned earlier about incentives. Do you ever think incentives will change in a way that lines up with a society that looks like how we want it to look because right now, Twitter, Facebook, you know, I'm sure they don't endorse harassment, but harassment means more uh, engagement and clicks and eyeballs. And that means more money for them. So do you think we'll ever see a world where incentives align with a society that feels good to live in? I think this is also where regulation can come in or we can introduce costs in other ways. So in Germany, they have much stronger regulation around not having Nazi content and there are costs associated with hosting that. And so in Germany, Twitter reacts much more quickly to reports of Nazi content. Um, so there are ways of capturing some of these costs 
in a way that reflects more of what we want for our society. I will say we also need to unpack what does it mean to you know, do things for the societal good, because there are often values that will be in conflict with each other as well. Um, when it comes to privacy, for example, it's often traded off against security. You think about if we had perfect information on every single person, it should be a lot easier to catch the bad guys and make sure they're not harming everybody. But that also means that you have information on everybody. Not great. And if you want anonymity, uh, that kind of sucks. So then you're thinking about how much do we want to compromise individual privacy in the name of collective security. And there's no single right answer. It's a trade-off of different values. And we need to have those conversations to decide where do we want to draw that line? Like what is the right balance we want as a society? And there's always going to be some people who are unhealth, uh, unhappy about this because there's different priorities that people put on these different values. But we should at least be able to talk about them transparently, discuss and have that reflected in technology as opposed to the people building technology just running away with whatever they want that serves their own purposes when there's no input from the people who are impacted by the technology. Right. <clears throat> no, that's that's well put. Okay, so Tracy, where can folks find more of what you do and find you online? Not to harass you, but to send you loving messages and, and great positivity. Um, Block Party is at blogpartyapp.com. You can also find um, privacypartyapp.com. They're all kind of linked, so whichever one you want to go to is fine. I am still on Twitter or X. <laughs> Why would you say uh, it was a sigh? Because <laughs> I'm also now on four other Twitter replacements. Okay. Um, on most platforms, I am Trikatora, T-R-I-K-E-T-O-R-A. It's a made-up word, and it's very difficult to spell and difficult to communicate verbally. Um, but on Instagram and threads, I am Exhausted Female Founder. <laughs> That's funny. What's the next party? So you have Block Party, Privacy Party. What's the next party? I'll have to let you know in the next episode. Okay, next party. We'll meet up again. We'll chat again. Yeah. Thank you so yeah, much for yeah. joining me, Tracy. Thanks, Xavier.